need your Bible this morning. I hope you brought it with you. We're going to be looking at several passages of Scripture in the book of Acts. We're going to start with Acts chapter 1 this morning. And uh, I have felt this message burning on my heart. And I trust the Lord will help us to deliver it in that same burning fashion. So since we have so much Scripture this morning to do, I'm not going to read my text first. We're going to pray for the message this morning one more time. And then ask God to help us. We'll be beginning our study this morning in the book of Acts. I think a pastor's job is not only to preach and to do the work of an evangelist, but to teach and to train up and to disciple and to help us to completely understand. When Ezra preached out in the Old Testament, he had a pulpit, he had a platform. And I guess maybe that's where our, our idea came from out of the book of Ezra. But he also, he said he read the word of God and he gave the sense of it. He explained it to the people. That's going to be the the mode this morning. Now, I'll be in and out of a preaching mode probably, but uh, I want you to to bear with me, to stay with me this morning. Try to think with me and try to capture what uh, the Lord has given me this morning and what the Word of God is saying to us. The Word of God is speaking to us this morning, and it will if we'll give Him ear. Just give Him ear to let Him speak to us, shall we? Father, we need your help one more time. We're praying for the anointing of God to be upon us this morning. We want the blessing of the Lord more than we want anything else at all. We want the presence of God in our midst more than we want anything else at all this morning. Because it's your touch and it's your presence that makes all the difference. It's not by might, nor by power, nor by intellect, nor by human ability, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts this morning. We thank you for your word. It's inspired. It's, in, uh, it's inerrant. Um, it's, uh, it's eternal this morning. Not one jot or one tittle will pass away. Till every word of it's fulfilled, we're glad we have it preserved for us this morning. In Jesus' name, help us to preach it. Amen. The subject of my lesson this morning and the recurring thought in every one of these passages is the phrase, in one accord. Twelve times in the book of Acts, you'll find that phrase, in one accord. And we're going to look through six or seven of those passages where that's at this morning, the Lord helping us. If the time gets away, we'll just, we'll just stop somewhere and continue tonight. Uh, that's my mode of operation. I, I, I don't want to rush through it till we don't get what we need to get out of it. So in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, actually let's read verses 12 through 14. In Acts chapter 1, then returned they unto Jerusalem. This is after the ascension of Jesus. The first part deals with he's ascended back to heaven. The clouds have taken him up out of their midst. And it says, and they returned unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Somehow or another, his brethren that were critical of him earlier in the Gospels have gotten saved. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? And in those days, Peter stood up and, well, I'm going to stop with verse 14. They continued with one accord. Now, you're going to find that phrase over and over, and you're going to find that theme expressed over and over in the epistles. The matter of the church being one. The matter of the church being unanimous in what it's trying to do. And uh, I think this matter of unity has, there's, there's come to an idea just like perfection. People come to me and the first thing they say is nobody's perfect. Maybe you said that. Well, your argument's not with me, your argument's with God. (laughs) Because God called two or three people in the word perfect. (laughs) But this thing of unity today, this thing of coming together in one mind and one accord, I believe we've kind of adopted a similar philosophy. It's not possible. Because no two people see two things alike. Friend, that is absolutely the fact. We don't see everything exactly alike. But we can see the main thing and put everything else aside. 
And that's evidently what happened here in the upper room. These people, 120 of them we know, were gathered together for a 10 day and they didn't know when it started how long it was going to be. They didn't have any idea how, they were going to, how long they were going to be there. Jesus told them to tarry until the Holy Spirit is poured out upon you. The promise of the Father is coming. You just go and pray and wait for it. Praise God for that. Are we willing to just get the mind of God and get the voice of God and then just stay at the job until something happens? <laughs> until God fulfills what he wants to do in us. Uh, we, we give up too quickly today. I'm so glad these 120 didn't give up, but I, I can almost imagine, and I've been in prayer meetings, and I've been in times where the Spirit has begun to bring people together for a common purpose and for revival. And friend, we can find that in those prayer meetings and in those times where you're seeking God to move in a mighty way, then God the Holy Ghost begins to shed light into your heart. And the Holy Ghost begins to reveal things to you that are areas of your life that you need to correct or you need to change or you need to, to adapt some different uh, mode of approach. And I can imagine that in this 10-day prayer meeting, there were confessions and there were, there were apologies and there were things of humility where the, one of the brethren, maybe James and John, said, you know, fellas, we, we, were, we were carnal, we were, we, were, uh, we were selfish, we wanted to set at his right hand and his left hand, and we even sought those positions from Jesus. Forgive us, brethren, forgive us. Let, us. let us not care who's first and who's second and who's third and who holds this seat and who holds that seat. Let's just see God move. Could you imagine something like that going on in that prayer meeting? where they begin to humble themselves and confessions were made and they begin to apologize and they begin to, to uh, make amends if they needed to make amends because I believe, friend, before we can ever get in one accord with the Holy Spirit, we're going to have to be right with God. I mean thoroughly, 100% right with God. That means that every sin that we've committed is under the blood of Jesus. I mean every one. And that means also, friend, that there is a clearness on the horizontal plane. That we've done everything in our power to, to make amends or to, to reconcile with someone who's offended us or maybe someone we've offended. We've apologized. We've took our part of the blame. And friend, I just believe in taking your part. I'm sorry. I don't believe in taking the blame for somebody else. I believe that's lying. And I know preachers that will tell you, you just take the blame, you just assume all the responsibility in the cause of peace. In, me, in my mind, that's lying. But I'm going to take my part of the blame, aren't you? I'm going to take what I'm responsible for, and I'm going to beg your forgiveness if I've offended you, if I've wronged you, if I've some way uh, upset you against me. I want, to, I want to beg your forgiveness. I want everything clear. The Bible says, as much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. Does that what it say? And doesn't Hebrews 12, 14, our great holiness text, doesn't it say first follow peace with all men? Doesn't it say be reconciled, be one to another? If your brother has all against you, go to your brother and talk to him. Friend, I believe this is what happened to get in one accord. And getting in one accord had some really phenomenal uh, uh, dynamics to it as we're going to see. But in order for this group of people, 120 of them, to get in one mind and one accord, that's impossible. There's no 120 people you can get together. Friend, my Bible says they were in one accord. Amen. Now you'll have to take up your argument with God because it says here these 120 people were in one accord. They were unanimous about what they were there for. And everything else was laid aside. Everything else was put aside because Jesus had told them to tarry until the Holy Spirit be given to you. Until you be endued with power from on high. Friend, and that's where we are today. That's our great need today. That is the lack of the church today is Holy Ghost power. I'm not getting many amens yet, but I'll, I'll get my own cards out. I can say it myself. Amen. That's right. I can but this matter, they were there to see God. And in order to see God move, we have to be thoroughly right with God. And as much as lieth within us, we're going to make every effort to be thoroughly right with our fellow man. 
Not everybody will let you be right with them. Not everybody will let you reconcile and, and bring back a, a, a good working relationship. That's not your problem. Your problem is to take care of your part and apologize for what you've done and make your restitutions if you've done something wrong and let the other fellow answer for God to God himself. If my relationship with God depended on everybody being reconciled that has gotten cross grain across the years, I'd never be able to make it because I can't make them reconcile. But I can get Roger Hatfield by the nap of the neck and the seat of the pants and said, son, you're going to take the blame for what you've done. You're going to assume the responsibility for what you've done and you're going to do your best to make amends whether they do or not. That's good preaching. That's good preaching. And that's what I believe took place in this first chapter of Acts when these 120 people were there for one purpose and the purpose was to see the glory of God poured out upon the church. What greater purpose could there be? And then in the second account of it, the, the second chapter starts out with the same very phrase. The second chapter of Acts is that great chapter that explains what happened when these people got in one accord. It tells us what happened. And verse 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. You know, just because we're in one place doesn't mean we're in one accord. We're all stuffed in this little room this morning, but that doesn't mean we're in one accord yet. We're all in the same predicament. We're human beings. We're on our journey to heaven. We're, we're fighting the devil. We're, we're dealing with different things in our lives. We're, we're in the same predicament. We're all human. Many of us are part of the family of God. That's part of a unity. That's part of the unity. But you can be in the same place, in the same predicament, and in the same family and not be in one accord. But these people, some way through prayer and obedience and humility, they, they got to the place where nothing mattered but seeing God move. And did God move? Just to highlight chapter 2, there were phenomenal things in the atmosphere. There was the sound of a rushing mighty wind that filled that place. There were cloven tongues of fire that seemed to light on the heads of those believers. Friend, there was a power that came through that room, cleansing and purging and filling them until the room couldn't hold them any longer. They spilled out of the upper room down on the street. They began to testify. They began to praise God. They began to preach until the people said, this, this bunch is drunk. Peter said, let it be known to you, it's only the ninth hour of the day. We're not drunken as you suppose, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your young people, your, your sons and daughters will prophesy. The old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. And Peter began to preach to that crowd. And friend, there were people from all over the known world with many different languages and dialects. And in the midst of that, Peter's message went out and through the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, it was interpreted to every single dialect that was there. You're talking about phenomenal. How'd you like to go to Miami airport, get right in the middle of that big airport and start preaching and every nation and every nationality there understands you perfectly. Would that be a miracle? You better believe it'd be a miracle. And it was a miracle on the day of Pentecost. What precipitated the miracle preacher? They were able to get in one accord, friend, is, is I believe the key to seeing God move because nothing hinders the work of the Spirit like sin and division. Would you agree with that? But when this supernatural came, it was a result of 10 days of praying and getting together and getting like-minded and getting to see what the main thing was and getting our eyes off of everything else except the main thing and say, oh God, we want you to move. We want you to do what you promised you're going to do. You know, there's some promises. We talked about claiming them in the Sunday school hour. There's some promises. He will pour water on him that is thirsty. He'll pour floods upon the dry ground. It talks about revival in the Testament. Lord, help us this morning to get a hold of something that will bring the glory of God into our midst. To get in such a mindset, to get in such unison about what we want to see God do. We want him to do what he wants to do. Friend, I don't have a program for this church. It tickles me just almost 
to death. That's a phrase that we use. When God sets me aside. You know those old-fashioned services where there, we had those good services, there wasn't any preaching. You know, they're working the preachers to death these days. We don't hardly ever get a break. Ever, ever specified preaching service, you got to plan on preaching. Because the crowd don't get free and the spirit doesn't move like he used to. And that bothers me. That concerns me. That the spirit's not working in those ways where he gets the preeminence. He gets the praise. Set the preacher aside. Set the music aside. Set it all aside. There was a church in Knightstown, Indiana some years ago, many years ago now. It was the church of the Nazarene when the fire and the glory was on them. And if I remember the story correctly, it was 39 Sunday mornings. There was no Sunday school. There was no preaching. The choir got up to sing uh, on this particular, the first Sunday morning that it happened. The choir was singing Blessed Redeemer. And the glory of God fell on that church. And for 30 some Sunday mornings in a row, friend, there was no, the, the choir got up to sing the same song for the next 37 Sundays. How boring is that? Listen, friend, throw your program away. Throw your preconceived expectations of the service away and ask God to do what he wants to do. So I'm afraid of that, Frieder. I'm afraid of fanaticism. I'm afraid of wildfire. Friend, if you're living a holy life and you want the holy God to manifest himself, it'll be anything but wildfire. Amen? But on that day of Pentecost, Peter's message, how fluent, how dynamic... An old weathered fisherman can be under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Fearful a few weeks before. Cowered down under pressure a few weeks before. But now he's right in the capital city pointing the finger at the Sanhedrin. You have crucified the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. You crucified the Christ of God. Wow, friend. What took over a man make him like that? What got a hold of a man that can quote scripture and preach a message, friend? A par excellence. Par excellence as you read Peter's message. He brought in the death and resurrection of Jesus, which is vital to our faith. Jesus died for your sins and rose again the third day, friend. I want to tell you, it was because some people got together and they wanted one thing and one thing only. They wanted to see God do what God wanted to do. I'm here to tell you, I want to see what God wants to do. If you come to see what I can do, you'll be disappointed. Because I can't do anything. But God can do everything. Well, I better move on. The third instance of this phrase is found in chapter 2, verse 46. Let me read verses 42 through 46. And they continued steadfastly. This is after 3,000 new converts have been added to the church, by the way. We'd like to see three. Wouldn't you? I'd be tickled to death this morning to see three new people get saved. And then three more and three more. I'd take it by one at a time if the Lord wants to do it. But they had seen 3,000 people saved. Verse 42, and they, the, the believers, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayers, and fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were were done by the apostles, and all that believed had, uh, were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. You notice what's happening here, friend? These disciples were enjoying pure Christian fellowship. They were getting together, breaking bread. They were going from house to house, having cottage prayer meetings. Have you ever been in a cottage prayer meeting? How long has it been? Friend, we used to have cottage prayer meetings. I can remember going to the house of the superintendent of schools in McDowell County, West Virginia. His wife was an Allegheny uh, godly lady. This man wasn't saved. She invited our little church to their house for a cottage prayer meeting. And we went in and sang and testified and preached to the superintendent of schools. I tell you, 
when God is working and God is moving, things begin to happen. And they're, they're having all things common. And I, there wasn't any selfishness in the church. Brother, you have a need, I can help out. Sister, you have a need, we can meet that need. We can help you with that. I mean, there was an unselfishness about this crowd. They had gotten a hold of something that had taken all the self out of them. Taken all the stinginess out of them. Here they are. They're, they're, they're walking in the light. And this is what I want to get to right now. They were there walking in the light. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. For in they were as a strict obedience to the word that was preached unto them. And I am so glad for what our brother said in Sunday school this morning. We've come to the idea that this is a spiritual smorgasbord. And that preachers are fallible. And yes, they are. But I want to tell you, friend, God calls preachers to preach the word. And if the word's being preached, it's incumbent on you to walk in the light of it. I mean, if it doesn't matter what I say, then send me on up the road. I mean, if I have no authority to preach and expect you to change your life when the Word of God comes right down your alley, when the Word of God comes right down your pathway and the truth is clear and plain and I have no expectation or you have no compulsion to obey that or walk in the light of it, then I'm wasting my time and your time. Preachers are just a waste of time. Just do what you want to do anyway. Wow, preacher. Friend, they got in one accord. They experienced the power of God. And that power of God in that revival atmosphere said, we want the truth. Pour it on us, preacher. How long has it been since you heard that phrase from the congregation? Pour it on us, preacher. Give it to us straight. We can take it, preacher. Wow. I want to know my worst estate now, friend. I mean, I'm going to pass an exam one day. I'm going to stand and take my finals at the judgment bar of God. I want to know what God's going to expect of me. I want to know where I am with God when I stand there. And it's up to the preachers to preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Rebuke, exhort, correct if need be, friend. We're there for that purpose. But the church today, you can't discipline anybody in this day. If you approach someone about their situation, they'll just quit. And go down to the road to the next church. And they'll put them in as a Sunday school teacher. Or something else. You can't discipline anyone today. This crowd won't be disciplined. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I don't have to listen to any preacher. And that's an absolute fact. You don't have to, friend. But if you're going to find your place in the place where God can bless you. And the place where God can send revival to the church. We're going to get back to taking the word of God and the man of God seriously. And let me tell you again. Let me say it one more time. We're not infallible. I make mistakes, you make mistakes. When I make a mistake, I have two requests of you. One of all, you will receive it as it is and pray for me and forgive me for my mistake. Secondly of all, you'll be man enough or woman enough in Christian love and kindness to come and show me my mistake. I'm opening myself up, aren't I? But that's all right. I've had people come to me and give me the worst tongue lashing you ever heard. I really don't need a tongue lashing. But I really need, if I'm off base somewhere, I really need for a good brother or sister to love me enough to take this blessed book and say, Preacher, this is where we think you missed it. Please pray about this. Huh? Can we do things biblical again? Can we get back to realizing that preachers are human? But I want to tell you, you're going to bring up to me all these rotten preachers, aren't you? All these scoundrels, all these wolves in sheep's clothing. Friend, if the church don't have enough discernment to know that he's a wolf in sheep's clothing, shame on you. And when it is revealed that he's a wolf in sheep's clothing, you don't have enough backbone to run him out of town, shame on you. There's a cure for these bad preachers. There's godly people that know how to pray that can discern right and wrong and can, can discern the blessing of God and not the blessing of God. And then there's godly men and women who will kindly and in Christian love say, brother, this is not what we need here. One time in my ministry, I had to send an evangelist home in the middle of the meeting. That is an awful, awful thing to have to be faced to do. I never want to go through that again. I hope I'm never faced with that again, friend. Where the evangelist got so far off base that I had to actually stop him in the middle of the meeting and ask him to leave. So said, I'd never do that, preacher. Well, that's awful you did that. Our young people were coming to, to me. It was at a youth camp. 
our young people were coming to me and said, Brother Hatfield, how are we going to get saved? He keeps us laughing. He was being a clown. He was being an entertainer. He was pantomiming Jesus, cleaning the temple and kicking over the tables and he was kicking everything on the altar over and everything in the pulpit over. Looked like a carnal fit. I don't believe Jesus had a carnal fit. I believe he overturned the tables of the money changers. But I believe he did it with a look and a zeal for the things of God and not a carnal, hot-headed temper tantrum. Listen. It's time the church really begins to take its own spirituality seriously and take the matter of revival as a life or death situation because it is. I don't remember the name of the man who gave this quote, but he said, revival is the inrush of the spirit into a church that threatens to become a corpse. The inrush of the spirit into a church that threatens to become a corpse. You know, we've already heard the statistics. That ought to break our heart. Thousands of churches closing their doors. The arise of the occult, the rise of witchcraft, sorcery, demon worship, Satanism. Do you know the trend this year is black Christmas trees? Absolutely. That has risen over the last few years. There's been an exponential growth in people who are looking for black Christmas trees. And the photo that Fox News put in their news column, the lady that was decorating it had, Satan is my daddy, written on her t-shirt. In America, friend. In America. It's on the rise. Why is it on the rise? Because the gospel light and the power of the Holy Ghost is not being manifested in the churches. We're not doing our job. We're not getting to the place where God can use us and pour out His blessing upon us because number one, many are not right with God. Number two, they're cross-grained with their fellow man. Sidetracked somewhere. Sidetracked. But oh, he said here, they were walking in strict obedience to the things of God. God calls pastors and evangelists to preach his word, expecting that his church will walk in the light of those messages. And again, please, the disclaimer is, if we get it wrong, please show us where it's wrong. Okay? Disciples were enjoying the fellowship. And that's a, a vital component. But they were spending time together collectively in prayer. It says that, that they came together and they were breaking bread. And in prayer, they were spending time seeking the face of God together. It wasn't all just fun, food, and fellowship. I think Christians need to get together for some fun, food, and fellowship once in a while. But I also think we need to get together sometimes just, just to seek God. Don't you? Don't you think we'll just get together sometime, Brother Hatfield? I'd just like you to come over this evening. I'd just like us to have a good prayer meeting. And listen, you don't have, if you want the pastor to come visit you on any kind of spiritual or, or pastoral role, you don't have to feed me every time. It'd be better for me if you didn't. <laughs> I'm saying that from a physical weight standpoint. It'd be better for me if we didn't eat every time we came. I enjoy eating, and I, I, I'm a social eater. If you offer me a piece of cake, I'll probably eat it to my own hurt sometimes, maybe. But listen, I don't want to offend you, but I'll tell you, there ought to be some times when the church, like the early church, they come together, friend. They come together for prayer. They come together to break bread and have communion and remember the, birth, the death and resurrection and the broken body of Jesus and the blood that was shed. They come together to break bread together. To celebrate the communion in the Lord's Supper. Well, the clock's going to whip me on this. I'm not going to get to it all. But in chapter 4 and verse 20, 23 through 31. These are what happened. This is what happened when the church got in one accord. Verse 23 of chapter 4. And being let go, they went to their own company. Now ahead of that, to give you the context, they've just been threatened for preaching. They've just been warned they're going to be put in jail if they don't stop doing what they're going to do. In verse 23 it says, And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all the chief priests had said unto them. And when they heard that, they went home and had a pity party, right? 
It says they went, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ for a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, friend, the place went away, they all went away dead as a mackerel. No, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. This is a subsequent infilling. And they spake the word of God with boldness, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. And the word soul is psyche, mind. They'd come to the point that one thing mattered more than everything else, and that is to do the will of God. Wow. I could see exciting days ahead for any church that gets in this kind of position. I could say we could get back to normal New Testament Christianity. This is normal New Testament Christianity, friend. Not dead, dry services. Routine, predictable services. And there needs to be some order. I'm not against order. God does things decently and in order. He is not the God of confusion. But I long for the times when God breaks up the order. Spontaneous testimonies. Spontaneous shouting. Spontaneous singing. If I could sing, y'all would be in trouble. Because I have a lot of choruses and songs over the last 40 years that speak to my heart and just wells up. I just don't have the voice to get it out properly. But I want you to know, these people... Into the midst of persecution, in the midst of uh, things going wrong, and uh, instead of cowering down, the disciples got bold. They had a prayer meeting. Instead of retreat, they said, "Forward! Give us more boldness. Give us more power to preach. Give us more authority in your name, Lord." They didn't care that jailhouse awaited them. They didn't care that maybe stripes and imprisonment waited on them. I tell you, this Sanhedrin had a lot of authority. You don't think they could lock you up? Ask James, the brother of John. They took his head off. You don't think this crowd gets angry when you preach the word? Ask Stephen. They weren't looking at a, a flowery bed of ease, friend. They were praying that God would have the glory. They were praying that the Holy Ghost would do what the Holy Ghost wants to do, and that's reach hearts. And you have to, you have to get ready to sacrifice yourself to do that. You put your own personal safety on the line. You put your own comfort on the line. Lord, I want what you want. I want revival in your way and in your definition. I want to see the Spirit move the way you want to see the Spirit move, Lord. Oh, church, I long for that. I've, seen, I've not seen what I read to you the other night about those, those great revivals of the early 1900s. I haven't seen it on that fashion. I've seen enough, though. I have seen enough. The verse of the Lord, we're not seeing what we used to even in my lifetime. You say, you're living in the past. No, I'm not living in the past. He's not the God that says I am or I was in my life. I believe what he did yesterday, he can do today. I believe it's going to take the church doing what the church did yesterday to get the same results today. I believe that this issue, and we've got more to say tonight, I believe, church, that this may be the single most important issue in our movement. Because every one of you that's been a Christian very long knows that the church world in general, and that includes the Baptists and the Methodists, were splintered to death. Yea, man or not, it's true. The average church in our movement must be 20 or 30 people. Preachers go and pastor five people. And thank God for men that are willing to do that. Thank God for those men. I'm not belittling five people. But is that what God really, when he looks down from heaven and looks at his church in America, 
Do you think he's satisfied? It said in, 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 in uh, Isaiah 53, he would see the travail of his soul. He would see his seed and the travail of his soul, and he would be satisfied. You think the Lord's satisfied with our churches? Not just our church, but our churches. I tell you, friend, these people weren't willing to stay quiet about it. They weren't willing to accept the status quo. They weren't willing to go into hiding in order to be Christians. They said, Lord, give us more boldness, and the place was shaken. The very building they were in shook, friend. And the Holy Ghost and power stepped in into that place. And they had a topping off of their spiritual experience. The Holy Spirit refilled them. And there might have been some new converts there that were filled the first time. It could have been a joint thing. But I believe some of those, the, and I do believe that you and I need a subsequent infilling once in a while. A fresh anointing, a fresh infilling of God's power and presence. Because spiritual fire has a tendency to go out. If you don't keep it flan, fanned and keep some fuel on the fire, keep some fresh wind and some fresh fire coming down, friend, it'll go out. But the, the multitude that believed were of one heart and one soul. And friend, they had, look at the results in verse 33 and 34, and then I'll close for this morning. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. It helped the preacher. <laughs> It helped the preachers preach with a greater anointing when the church is in one mind and one accord. It gave the preacher liberty. It gave him power. Friend, someone said that they'd come to see Spurgeon's church in England and the custodian told two young college boys, said, you want to see the heating system of this church? Of course, the doors were locked. It was before church. And they wanted to get in. Says, yeah, let's see the heating system. That custodian took those two college boys, as the story goes, down to the basement of that great church in London and opened the double doors to an underground big uh, a room and said there were over 400 men on their knees and on their face before God, begging God to, to move in the service that day and anoint their pastor. Friend, who couldn't preach with 400 men in treating God like that for you? Whose anointing wouldn't come? Friend, I want to tell you something. We have a responsibility. I have one to you, and you have one to me. I have the responsibility to preach to you what God gives me. You have the responsibility to pray for me. And pray that the Spirit will move in such a way that it, the anointing will come. The conviction will come. The power of God will be here. We have a responsibility together to see God move. And great power was upon the apostles and great grace was upon the church. Wouldn't you like to see great power and great grace working in our church? Oh, I'm glad for what measure of grace I have, preacher. I am too, friend. But there's something about great grace that excites me a little bit. There's something about the power and moving of God that excites my spirit. These people were there not to cower down, not to bemoan their circumstances, not to tell God how bad it was and how pitiful they were. They were being mistreated. I don't read any of that. What I see, Lord, is we're, we, we, we want you to have the preeminence, Jesus, because his crucifixion and death were fresh in their minds. He gave all for you, friend. What are you giving for him? Can we lay aside our differences? Come together? Reconcile in the grace of God? That'd be wonderful if there's, any, if there's any things that's cross-grained between anybody in this building. I urge you to get it fixed. If there's any unfinished business in your soul, if there's not a clear witness in your heart that Jesus lives there and that every sin is under the blood and you're walking with joy in every ray of light, friend, you've got business to take care of. The altar's open. Because revival is not coming until the church gets thoroughly right with God and thoroughly right with one another. And then they will have that oneness, they will have that unity, and they will have that singleness of vision. You know, we've got so many things on the burner. Some fellow said, I've got so many irons in the fire, can't get none of them hot. That's pretty much the case in America, isn't it? We've got so much going. We can't get anything hot. But I think we better start taking time 
to put him first and seeking him in such a way to so, Lord, I want you to do for us what you want to do. Lay my prejudices aside. Lay my preconceived ideas of how you're going to do it. It's one of the biggest things that hinders people in Christian work is preconceived ideas. What you think God's going to do. You're like old Naaman. I thought he would come and look up to heaven and pray some flowery prayer and slap his hand over the leprosy and it'd be some great demonstration of the prophet's ability. He didn't even step outside the door. He sent a message by his servant to the mighty general Naaman. Go dip in muddy Jordan. I thought he would have said, I thought he would have done this. I thought he would have done that. I thought. It's one of the biggest problems in our day. We think we know more than God. This book is true. What I've preached to you this morning is a result of people getting clear with God. And getting clear with one another. And getting God first and foremost in their heart. Shall we stand? To be continued. But if you have a need this morning, don't go home with that need. Come up here and let Jesus save you or sanctify you. Get rid of anything that's in your heart. If there's any unforgiveness or ill will toward anybody. Friend, you better get rid of that mess. It will kill you and destroy you. And void your chances of getting to heaven. For if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you yours. That's the Bible. I'm excited about what God wants to do. I'd like to have some people get in the excitement boat with me. Amen. If you have a need this morning, friend, there'd be no better time than to pray. It's 12 up, straight up 12 o'clock. The pot roast will make it another 30 minutes. If you have a need, let's pray about it. If you want to see revival, go home and pray about it. If you don't believe what I preached is true, go home and reread it. Oh, we want him to come. We want God to come. We want him to do what he wants to do with his church. It's his church. He's the head of the church. Let's put him back up there. Let's let him run the church. What do you say? Amen. Thank you for coming. Your kind attention this morning. And I hope you'll prayerfully consider and go ahead and search out the rest of my points in the book of Acts and be prepared for tonight. Amen. Sister Dyer, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Sister Babaji.